You are listening to another episode of the Rich Innovation Station podcast, an initiative of Buying Rich in Brazil and Confab that highlights the priorities and mutual challenges of research, development, and innovation between the European Union and Brazil. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a new podcast of the Enrich Innovation Station. It's an initiative of Enrich in Brazil and the Brazilian National Council of State Funding Agencies, CONFAP, with the objective of highlights, mutual priorities and challenges for the European Union and Brazil in research and innovation. I'm Carlo Cauti, I'm president of the Foreign Correspondent Association in Brazil. And today I have the pleasure and honor of presenting this podcast entitled Research and Innovation in Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. This is now our podcast number 10. And in order to discuss, to deal with this interesting and important issue, we have with us some exceptional international guests starting with Mr. Stefan Hogan, Head of Sector, Stakeholder Engagement and Communication of the G Research and Innovation of the European Commission. Thank you to be with us. Thank you. Hello from Brussels. Hello. We have also Mr. Eduardo Zancul, Agent Panel of Research for Innovation of the Sao Paulo Resist Foundation, FAPESP. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure of all yours. And then we have Professor Jason Lima, President of the State Funding Agency of Rio de Janeiro, FAPERJ. Thank you for being with us. It's a great pleasure to be here, too. Hello from Rio. Thank you very much. So let's start with the first question. I'd like to start with Mr. Hogan presenting the action carried out to take the COVID-19 pandemic from the European Commission point of view. What the European Commission is doing in order to tackle this pandemic? Please, Mr. Hogan. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me, Carlo. Well, as you know, the pandemic has now reached over 51 million cases worldwide today and uh, already killed over 1 million, actually 1.3 million people. It has also dramatically affected our economies, our, our social fabric, our mental health, and it's going to have long lasting changes on the way we work and live. So what uh, have we, the European Commission, done in the area of research and innovation in response to, and may I say, in anticipation of this crisis? Let's start with that. Well, the Commission has for uh, a long-standing record of investing in research infrastructures and the large-scale collaborative research on infectious diseases that contribute to our preparedness. Through the last two seven-year framework programs, we've invested over 4 billion re euros in uh, research on infectious diseases, including on viral diseases and on antimicrobial resistance. It, uh, this has also helped build European and global networks. I give some examples. Prepare project, which supports the readiness of hospitals in Europe and enhances their understanding of the dynamics of the outbreak. Uh, we have two new major projects for surveillance of infectious diseases, which were just launched in January, uh, independently from the current crisis. These are the VO project, the Versatile Emerging Infectious Diseases Observatory, which will be doing data mining, including the use of social media, and the Mood project, which monitoring outbreak events via data mining and epidemic modeling. Uh, we also have the ZAPI project, which is on zoonotic, called Zoonotic Anticipation and Preparedness Initiative, which is funded through uh, IMI, which is a partnership we have with the pharma industry, with whom we're working closely. And uh, in the area of research infrastructures, we support, we've been supporting for some years now, the European Virus Archive, which is a virtual collection of human, animal, and plant viruses that provides researchers all over the world um, the necessary material for, for their research, including for diagnosis. It was initially a purely European collaboration. It now involves 50 institutes worldwide. And also at the international level, we've been championing Globidar. This is a network which facilitates global research collaboration for infectious disease preparedness. It brings together research funding organizations across the world, including from Brazil. We have three uh, institu institutions involved at the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPES, which is represented here today as well, also Instituto Butantan and Instituto Fiocruz. So another aspect of preparedness is the ability to rapidly mobilize uh, research funding for such emergencies. And for that, we have since some years a special budget line on standby to launch emergency call. And we've used it in the past for Ebola uh, and Zika uh, and also uh, other, other emergencies. And of course, it was the first way we could respond to this present crisis. It allowed us to launch a call for uh, what we call expressions of interest on January 30th, which was the same day WHO declared COVID-19 to be a public health 
health emergency of international concern. And with that, we mobilized close to 50 million euros and funded 18 projects on diagnostics, medicines, and vaccines. And we're seeing some already some encouraging results. Those projects got started very quickly. And one of them, uh, I'll just give you this example, is using supercomputing to explore repurposing of existing drugs, hoping to find uh, solutions to address COVID. And, and they've had some uh, interesting hits. Um, they've uh, identified a generic drug uh, which uh, is normally used uh, to, to treat uh, something completely different, um, osteoporosis. And it seems to be effective uh, treating uh, certain, as certain phases of uh, COVID infections. And right now it's moving to clinical trials. Now we already know that drug is safe. So it's a huge gain in years. And, uh, and the hope that if we prove that it's efficacious, we can actually put it, on, uh, put it out uh, into use. Um, then we launched some other initiatives in May. We sent a, we published a, another call uh, for close to 130 million, 23 new projects to look at other aspects, to adapt manufacturing, to make uh, uh, protective equipment, develop medical technologies and digital tools for diagnostics, for instance, and to better understand the behavioral and the social economic impacts of the pandemic. We also redeployed some other funding instruments from this innovative medicines initiative from the European Investments Council. Um, we also mobilized some financial support uh, from a specific tool which helps to support some European companies like CureVac and BioNTech to help develop their, uh, their vaccines, in this case, messenger RNA vaccines. We also increased our contribution to CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. And altogether, uh, we have committed over just over a billion euros for research from the current Horizon 2020 program as part of our pledge to address this pandemic. We also have a role in coordinating efforts at European level uh, with uh, other European countries. And uh, we've set up a, era, a corona, ver corona action plan with 10 priority actions. We, this is, we have all the countries on board. This has helped us. And first area it's helped us with is in uh, sharing results. Uh, we've set up a, a special platform, the European COVID-19 data platform, which has been already very popular and helps us share uh, rapid sharing of, of data, making it available to other researchers. And um, although this this is a global disaster, uh, which we haven't seen the end, it's really encouraging that we see that the response has been, and more has been done faster and with more intense cooperation at European and at global level than ever. So hopefully this has also changed the way we do research. Uh, the cooperation at global level, systematic sharing of results, joining efforts, pooling resources, to ensure that everyone has access to diagnostics, treatments and vaccines as soon as possible. This extraordinary level of cooperation should be the new normal. And as we prepare now for our next framework program, Horizon Europe, which is due to start next year, we expect to increase our investments in preparedness, and of course, we will continue to foster collaboration between researchers and between research funding organizations, as well as with industry and other key stakeholders, of course, in Europe, but also with all our international partners. Finally, uh, we've, seen, we've seen the considerable human cost uh, and societal cost of this pandemic. And uh, everyone realizes that this is that investing in preparedness and research is probably one of the best investments we can make in the face of, of, of this disaster and to, and to prepare for the probable next ones. Uh, hundreds of millions we would need to invest to prepare for pandemics. It's not a lot when you compare it to the hundreds of billions that governments have had to spend to, on healthcare and on economic measures to mitigate the impact of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rogan. I would like to ask the same question to Mr. Zankun, but from a Brazilian point of view. So what kind of actions uh, were carried out uh, to take out the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, kind of action undertaken by Brazilian authorities in order to tackle COVID-19 pandemic? Please, Mr. Zankun. Thank you again for the opportunity to share the actions undertaken by FAPESP, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Soon as COVID-19 cases increased, FAPESP started working to structure two rapid response actions to direct research efforts to deal with the challenges brought by COVID-19. In these two actions, the general concept was uh, one, was to take advantage of established research streams and groups that was already supported to direct our efforts to deal with COVID-19. So we aimed to leverage existing projects and competencies. By leveraging the pre-existing research efforts, the response has been much faster. Based on this general concept, the first FAPESP action was a call for rapid implementation of supplementary resources for already existing research projects in related areas that would refocus their project to deal with the new emergency challenges brought by COVID-19. 
The call first selected more than 60 projects in areas such as medicine, immunology, pharmacology, and also information technology, among others. And the granted projects, they include uh, uh, various uh, topics uh, like principles for vaccine development and alternatives for diagnostic methods and kits. The second FAPESP action was a call for innovation projects under the umbrella of the already existing FAPESP program called PIPE that supports innovative research projects in small and medium enterprises. In this case, the general concept was to foster projects that was were already in an advanced stage uh, to accelerate their potential introduction in the market. The call considered joint resources from FAPESP and also FINEPI. And this call selected six projects from different companies, including one project on body temperature monitoring, two projects on diagnosis kit, one project on a portable ventilator and one additional project on electrical impedance tomography to improve COVID-19 treatment. And considering the company innovation PP program that I just mentioned, it is also very important to highlight that the program supported previous developments that proved it to be extremely relevant in this time. For instance, one of the main Brazilian ventilators company that supplied a high share of the current demand caused by COVID-19 had its innovative product development supported by FAPESP PP back in the years of uh, between 2006 and 2012. So this effort started more than 10 years ago. This evidence shows us how important it is to have an established and prepared research and innovative innovation ecosystem to support the current needed developments. In a summary, FAPESP has currently more than 80 projects directed to fighting COVID-19. This fast response was only possible because of pre-existing established research system, including academic research, but not limited to academic research, also including innovative companies that could rapidly redirect their efforts in this emergency dramatic situation and to bring responses to that we all need. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then I would like to ask the same question to uh, Professor Lima about the actions carried out to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic here in Brazil, in particular from a FAPERG point of view. Please, Professor Lima. Okay. Well, in the same line of my colleague from, from FAPESP, FAPERG, even before the pandemic, had already a series of uh, initiatives, on, uh, especially on emerging and re-emerging infectious disease that's a network since the Zika pandemic and uh, the first action in fact when who declared the COVID-19 pandemic we launched for proposals and the first one was exactly to strengthen this network of a research on emerging and re-emerging virus and uh, in a similar way to FAPES and also to federal funding agents we also launched a fast track call for proposals in, uh, in different for different projects, especially for projects already funded by FAPERG, but that could include the perspective of uh, COVID-19, and that uh, was not only in biomedical and, and health science, but also in engineering and also for funding, for example, for ventilators and, and other equipments. And we also, since February, we start to work with the, uh, our Secretary of Health in the Rio de Janeiro also to have uh, to establish uh, six networks to research on SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. So these networks would be Focus on, on six different aspects. The first one in the epidemiology, well, use of uh, epidemiological tools, including genomics to track the infection rates. Another network was established to, to develop new diagnostic tools. And uh, this is quite important because at the beginning, we just had the ELISA and uh, several developers have been done, important events. The third network was quite, is equally important because it was focused on the strength of the, the infrastructure to work with the virus, especially biological level safety tree facilities. And this, of course, takes time, but uh, we did that very quickly. And some uh, labs that uh, were adapted to work with, with the virus that requires uh, 
and biological layer of safety three. And uh, we also, I think another network was, of course, on the clinical trials, especially on some uh, drugs that uh, have been tested, that have been used with other, some medicine that have been used for our disease. And then uh, these clinical trials were, have been also supported. And, and finally, the support of work, for example, on vaccines and also passive immunization therapy, for example, use of a heterologous hyperimmune globulins, for example, from horse. So at a total, last year, we had uh, launched a call that uh, started the funding of 18 network in health science, and they all these 18 network groups have worked on COVID-19. That brings the number of about more than 100 projects uh, supported by FAPERG and working with COVID-19, and that about more than 200 1,000 PhDs doing research on COVID-19. So that's it's quite important. I mean, the Rio de Janeiro State has, in addition to the groups at the university, we have institutes like Fiocruz and other groups that are working on different aspects of COVID-19. And this, the funding by FAPERG has been very important, not only to, to look ahead, to develop, and eventually uh, how to tackle the problem that uh, we may have a vaccine, but uh, we're not sure how long will last the immunity. So there are at least three groups working on vaccine development. And also equally important is to have exactly the, the groups working, for example, using uh, artificial intelligence to predict the course of uh, the disease, if there is the possibility of a second wave. And of course, this second wave will not be in the whole state but we will eventually will be located in some cities and this is very important. So I would say that uh, to the excellence in research of uh, the state of Rio de Janeiro, the university, the research institute and some biotech companies, we trying to deal with this problem that in Brazil has led to the death of more than 106,000 people. Thank you. Thank you very much. To listen to all episodes of the podcast and reach Innovation Station, access Spotify, YouTube channels of Confab and Enrich in Brazil. I would like to continue with you, Professor Lima, in order to talk about how the EU-Brazil cooperation may be an asset in order to tackle joint solution to this kind of common challenges like COVID-19. Like how the European Union and Brazil can cooperate in order to face these kind of challenges. No, definitely. I think uh, we heard this uh, week the good news that company from biotech that to get the Pfizer have the first results on phase three of a vaccine, of a RNA vaccine. So I think there is plenty of room for collaboration. I think in this field of vaccine development, especially, I, I think we can give the example of some groups, for example, in uh, Vito Brazil Institute, together with the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, that using the spike protein, the protein that the most important one, and that it has been used the most of the vaccines, either the protein or the gene. And this protein has been used to get hyperimmune globulin that can be used that will be will go very soon to clinical trials as uh, for therapy and i think it's important that if you look at other diseases it's always important to have complementary approach of course prevention with a vaccine is very important but it's also good to have ways of treatment i think this is a good room for cooperation also, I think another place that we have room for cooperation is in the development of uh, in improving the infrastructure, for example, in the clinical beds, the hospital beds, especially when the patient needs to get into a worse situation and requires, for example, mechanical ventilation, for example. I think that's also room. And also another thing that I'm pretty sure that will be more for the next six, 12 months or one or two years, everything has been very fast in uh, COVID-19 science, but I think at some point there will be, it will be important to have uh, the development of a sterilized vaccine, a vaccine that uh, makes sure that uh, we, one can have longer immunization periods. We don't know yet, but we will learn after some of the vaccines come registered to be used and then we'll follow the phase four. I think all these areas is plenty of uh, possibilities of uh, cooperation. And then I would list since from the basic science that we needed to understand more, a lot of the physiopathology of the disease, why the virus hits 
other organs in, in addition to the, to the lungs and to understand how the process goes, eventually gets beyond control and uh, leads to death. And so that's also can be studied from the perspective of molecular biology tools, structural biology tools, especially immunological approach to understand both how the organisms develop immunity against the virus, both what's called humor uh, immunity and also the cellular immunity that is still not very well understood the role of the cellular immunity. So I think uh, we are open to in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, most of the science have participated in networks, in Brazilian networks involving uh, research from Sao Paulo and from different states in Brazil, and that will be very important and already have a lot of cooperation with European unit research, and that can be strengthened. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lima. Same question also for to Mr. Zancu, uh, how the European Union Brazil cooperation may be an ace in order to tackle the joint solution to this kind of common challenges as COVID-19, obviously on a FAFESP point of view. Please, Professor Zancu. From our point of view, the European Union Brazil cooperation has been fundamental in the research and innovation developments uh, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and has already produced extremely relevant results over the, the past years. And certainly there is a need and possibility to continue this path. Uh, currently, we may consider two types of common challenges for Europe and Brazil. We have the immediate emergency health challenges and all the immediate economic and societal impacts resulting from the pandemic. But also looking in the near future, following, you'll have recovery challenges in the economy, but not only in the economy. For years, we'll need to follow the pandemic impacts and develop solutions for the pandemic consequences that are affecting very a lot of areas, uh, not only limited to healthcare, including, for instance, education, to mention one example, that has been tremendously impacted by the, the pandemic. From the economy point of view, uh, in order to access opportunities, you'll probably need to speed up accelerate the developments in high potential areas in order to support economic recovery. And some areas that are promising are bioeconomy, energy, digitization, among other various areas that uh, may pose opportunities for economic development in, in the near future. And in order to deal with all these uh, challenges, cooperation uh, needs to be strengthened uh, because we already learned uh, from the past that cooperation such as EU and Brazil bring uh, results. There will be need to further evolve uh, the cooperation mechanisms that are in place. Uh, there is also opportunity to increase possibilities of data sharing and result sharing following current international trends. Uh, just to mention one example, FAPESP recently led with uh, partners the development of a COVID-19 data sharing platform with data from more than 5 million anonymous exams that can be widely employed to support research. So initiatives like this one and other mechanisms that may foster collaboration will certainly be needed if we want to seek for the answers and results that society will demand as a consequence of COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Same question as well, this time from an European point of view to Mr. Rogan how the European Union and Brazil can cooperate in order to tackle COVID-19 and other common challenges. Please, Mr. Logan. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Before I go into the specifics of what's just been discussed, I'd just like to mention we have already a rich collaboration with Brazil. I mean, international cooperation is, is continues to be a very important feature of our programs. Uh, we, we're just looking back now at, our, at the current seven-year program, which is just ending now. Just in the health component, the health research funding, we have over 100 countries, just over 100 countries involved. So our programs are very open and they're really an opportunity for, for collaboration. Brazil has been quite well represented in, the, in our program. Um, there are 26 participation in, in various projects, and they are uh, including two in our in our last uh, special COVID call, which I'll come back to. We have half of these participations are coming from the special three projects that came from a, a special Zika research call we published uh, in 2016 from this emergency budget uh, mechanism I mentioned earlier. And then we have eight participants in five cancer research projects, which was on also a special topic to foster collaboration on cancer cancer research between European and what we call the CELAC countries, that's the Latin American and 
Caribbean states. Um, and we also have a, a CSA, a coordination support action to foster collaboration with uh, between our two regions on personalized medicine. Uh, and we also had a project involving a, a Brazilian participant from Ebola, which was also a special uh, call. So now uh, the most recent additions to this is on the COVID and, and more specifically on uh, on cohorts, uh, cohort studies. So we are funding a, a very large uh, project with uh, 26 or more participants, 20 million euros, uh, over a dozen countries involved, uh, including Brazil, of course, and they will collect research on cohorts uh, to find ways how to see the impact of, of, of treatments and, and that way we can improve treatments. Um, that's just one aspect that will be examined uh, through orchestra. That's a very valuable tool to, to look at those long-lasting effects uh, that, that were mentioned earlier. And then we have an associated project called Uncover, which is, uh, it's, not some, it's not for research per se, but it's a coordination and support action to, to foster international collaboration, uh, to link uh, cohorts um, across across the, the world. And again, there uh, we have 29 partners in Including, including one uh, from Brazil. So these, these are really important and we must continue with these. And, and these, are, these are also areas of collaboration with, which are obviously important to, to both regions and both continents and, and further afield. Um, I'd also like to, to come back to what I, I mentioned earlier, the GLOPID network, which is the, this global research collaboration for infectious disease preparedness. And I really insist on preparedness because we really need to also really look at the, how to better manage this crisis, but also prepare for the, for the next ones. And, and, it's really good to see that Brazil is so involved in this uh, in this initiative with three different institutions, and uh, and the aim is to, is to ensure that we respond fast and well to outbreaks to better coordination of our efforts. And again, not only for this pandemic, for for possible and unfortunately likely next ones to come. And um, another aspect of this is to, is to really make sure that our funding agencies are talking to each other to develop best strategies at global level and also to how to learn from each other. So that's all very important. We see that in this area, the issue of tracking activities is very important to, see, to make sure that we know what each funding agency is funding to avoid duplication, but also to ensure uh, that we can have some synergies. And I think there we could have more of the projects tracked there that uh, from Brazil that would be uh, very useful. So we can already make immediate quite straightforward additions and sharing information on this. If we look to the next programs, uh, we, we see that we want to encourage more collaboration with Brazil. We want to uh, make sure that Brazilian researchers are aware of our programs, they work with their European colleagues to, to join some of our initiatives. And also in, in passing, I'd like to mention that Brazilian researchers are also encouraged to register as experts for evaluating proposals in our program. We very often call upon researchers, experts from outside the EU to help us assess proposals. First of all, because we don't have all the expertise in Europe and, and we really need to look as broadly as we can across the world. Um, we can also learn from, from these already existing agent projects. I mean, if we look just at the cluster of Zika projects, uh, which was, which are ongoing, they actually also looked at uh, one of them at uh, cohorts and set up infrastructure cohorts. And some of this has already been repurposed to address COVID. And we need to explore now how we can maintain that, how we can make the most of this and to learn from and exploit these investments. So I think all of these things are important. We are also taking a very broad view on, on addressing the disease, the, the COVID disease, and the, the, the deeper impacts of the pandemic, whether it be uh, behavioral, uh, social, uh, economic. And I think this type of research, uh, as was said uh, by, by other speakers, it's, it's really important that we take a long view on this because we have, we're just beginning to see some of the aspects some of the negative aspects of this pandemic and maybe a few positive ones i don't know and uh, on behavior on mental health on socioeconomics so i think that's and all of these areas we need to continue to explore together thank you thank you very much mr Logan. unfortunately we have no more time uh, our podcast ends here I, I will have a ton of questions to ask to our guests but our time is running out and we must conclude but first i would like to thank you all our international guests for their intervention firstly starting with mr stefan hogan from the european commission thank you very much for being with us thank you and also to mr eduardo zancourt from fapespi thank you very much for being with us thank you also it was a pleasure it was a pleasure as well and thank you to professor gerson lima from Faperj. thank you very much thank you so unfortunately our podcast ends here but thank you also for our audience follow us thank you also for our sponsors who allow the realization of this podcast in particular the european union delegation in brazil but also confapi and cnae and all other sponsors and thank you for our audience we can find us on spotify you can have the complete list of all the podcasts 
uh, that we create and we made uh, by the, this project, just going on Spotify and write and reach E-N-R-E-C-H. Thank you very much for everybody and see you soon.